Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me at Microsoft? Yeah, yeah. Hello, yes. welcome. So, uh, today, uh, here uh, in, uh, in Seattle, um, you probably don't see this from Microsoft, we have the industrial affiliate meeting, and it's now going on. Uh, there is a lot of activity in our building, and we have uh, now food and drink, and it's, there is like a big party going on. Uh, we are kind of isolated here, but outside in the building, it's, uh, it's wild. Um, so if you hear any noise or if you uh, see anything unusual, it's because of this, uh, of this meeting going on. Uh, okay, so uh, let me start with announcements. Uh, homework 3. Uh, it's now, um, uh, you're probably already working on it. Uh, it's due next week. Uh, there have been some questions. Uh, First, each customer has, a, has exactly one rental plan. That's what the homework says, and we'll stick to this. Uh, which means you have to think about how to implement this. It, it cannot have zero rental plans. It can have exactly one. Uh, just think about how to represent this. Um, another thing that I really insist, whenever you have a many-one relationship, you do not implement this with a new table. A many in one relationship means uh, just a foreign key, right? If you have a many, many relationship, that requires a new table. But a many in one relationship does not require a new table. That is just a simple uh, foreign key. So that was also true for homework two. Uh, I realize I did not emphasize this uh, hard in, um, strongly enough. Uh, but it's, it's implicit in the, it's, it's stated in the, um, uh, on the slides, so it's, it's right here. Uh, but again, you, you have to pay attention in homework three, you don't, should not implement uh, many one relationship uh, using a table. Also, some people would like to use Postgres here in the department, and it's now available on QBIST. And uh, Param will set up instructions on how to, uh, how to access it. If you have any questions about this, please send an email to Param and to me. Any other questions about homework three? I have a question. Yes. Did he send an email saying that every table should have a key? But how can we do an history where you, I can rent the same movie five times in a month, right? Because I like that movie and I want to watch it, return it, I want to watch it again and return right. it. Right, so the question is how, how, can you, uh, how can a customer rent the same movie several times and keep the history? Well, what would be an ob obvious solution here? Yes? Add a timestamp? Like a, add a timestamp uh, or insert the, the date when, uh, when, when that rental happened. Yeah? Does this answer your question there? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so you need to be a little bit creative. It's not it's not 100% smooth. You have to do something about about this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so that that's another possibility. So uh, if it um, uh, you you could have a, a, only one or two records per uh, movie and user. So if the if the user runs the same movie a second time then you essentially um, lose a history. But it's much nicer if you keep the history around. So then you, you need to have several entries for the same user movie pair. Any more questions about homework three? Homework four is now posted, uh, or should be posted. Param is uh, supposed to uh, link it from the main uh, uh, website. Uh, it's, it's a collection of problems from both textbooks, from uh, uh, the Ramakrishnan and Gerke textbook and from the Orman and um, uh, Orman Garcia Marina, Molina Widom textbook. Uh, the, the, the problems from the other textbook, they are uh, listed in clear, so they are copied. They, you have the full text and, and the homework. You don't, you don't need the book to, uh, to uh, do the homework. Uh, however, the book is a good, it's a recommended reading uh, just because the material in the book is, um, um, I mean, the, 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 home, the, the questions are based on the material in the book. Uh, 
Everything you need to know about to solve this homework we covered in class. So technically you don't need the book, but uh, some people would like to have the book and I have two copies in, sitting in my office. I was supposed to bring them here. Uh, I'm going to bring them during the break. And uh, you can lend them from me and share them if you, if you would like to read the book. Um, okay, so I don't have anything else to say about the next homework. It's due in two weeks. No programming, which is the good news. Okay, so where are we? Um, we discussed um, uh, transaction last time, and we are going to continue uh, discussing transactions today. Uh, perhaps even next time if we don't finish what we have to cover today, which is quite likely. So um, there are two aspects to transactions, uh, recovery, recovery from crashes. And here we discussed last time a very simple uh, um, undo log and a very simple redo log. They just highlight the basic principles in a, in, a re, in a recovery manager. That's what we discussed last time. Then we started to discuss uh, concurrency control, and we only discussed uh, serializability, the definition of serializability. And today we will continue concurrency control, and we will uh, start by discussing uh, a log-based scheduler. Uh, and um, after that, we are going to discuss some more, more advanced topics in uh, transactions. Uh, first, I'm going to show you the weak isolation level in SQL. Uh, they're not that advanced, but um, we need to discuss them. Then we are going to discuss areas. I definitely want to finish the discussion of areas today. And we may stop either here, uh, right after areas, or we might um, start discussing the advanced concurrency control mechanism, uh, the optimistic concurrency control algorithm, uh, and we'll see how far we get. Um, we, we might finish them or we might discuss them uh, next time. So that's where we are. Now, before we start uh, today's topic, I want to have two uh, discussions. The first discussion is the one we postponed from last time, is to discuss uh, the paper on query answering using views. So by now, I hope everybody wrote, uh, read sections uh, one, two, and perhaps three from the paper. Uh, and let me ask you this: What is what is this thing? What is query answering using view? Using views. What is this problem? Who can define the problem of query answering using views? You have to reformulate the query so that you get an equivalent query that uses only views. Right. That's exactly what the problem is. You have to reformulate the query to get an equivalent query that only uses the views. So let's, step, let's make a step backwards. First of all, you have these views sitting around. So for some reason, you have pre-computed some views. You have materialized some views over the data, uh, which meant some effort. Uh, maybe this involved uh, computing joins, maybe some aggregates, some group eyes. It took a few minutes to compute these views, or maybe hours, if they are very big. So now you have them. They are there on disk. And you get a new query. Uh, and the question is, this query, it refers to the base tables. It doesn't refer to the views. It refers to the base tables. But the question is, can you, in a smart way, rewrite this query such that it uses the views, which you have already computed, as opposed to redoing the work uh, and uh, doing, computing again the same joints and the same aggregates? That is a query uh, answering problem using views. Now, there are actually two, two variants. One is called query answering. And the other is called query rewriting. Did anyone understand what the distinction is between query answering using views and query rewriting using views? The paper talks mostly about query rewriting using views, which means exactly what we said. You, we re rewrite the expression of the query to use uh, only the views or to use the views in some base tables. Uh, in query answering using views, we relax this a little bit and we say, 
Maybe we can answer the query by using some, some arbitrary algorithm that reads the views, not necessarily a query. Uh, and this, th th then we get a um, slightly more expressive power. It's a, it's a subtle distinction. I, I don't want to go in any deeper into this. So is it clear what the problem is, the query answering using views problem? Now, uh, we find this in very many places. And I wanted to discuss just two, two applications. The first one is um, physical data independence. What is actually physical data independence, regardless of the query answering using view use question? What is physical data independence? What is the principle of physical data independence? Yes? It doesn't matter how you store your data. You should be able to have some logical structure that you query against. Exactly. You should, you should be able to have a, a logical structure that you query against. And under, underneath, you should be free to, to modify the physical layout of the data to add indexes, to drop indexes, to modify indexes, to modify the way the data is stored without affecting the application. The application should see exactly the same logical uh, representation of the data. This is, uh, this is um, um, physical data independence or data independence. Now, what does this have to do with query answering using views? Well, if the physical data underneath change, the tables underneath the, the view change, so you just have to change the view, how it populates. So where is the view here? Yes. The, the logical structure. So it's, it's very similar because you're querying this abstract concept, and then if you have to translate that into <coughs> getting data from the underlying physical representation. Right. That's, that's the thing. So there are now two, two pieces of data. There, are, there, there is a physical representation of the data, and then there is a logical representation of the data. Now, the logical representation is not stored. Right? Nobody has a, that table. And the only, we only have the files that, that hold the data from which we can reconstruct the table. So the physical representation are the views. Maybe our table maybe is partitioned into some physical, uh, maybe it's vertical, vertically partitioned into several tables, maybe even distributed maybe. Uh, and um, uh, these are views over what we would like to query, over the logical table. So now when the query is formulated over the logical table, we can't answer it. We have to rewrite it in terms of the physical tables. And that is a connection to um, query answering using views. It's a very elegant concept. It was actually introduced by uh, people from the University of Wisconsin uh, in the early 90s before this query answering using views problem was uh, well understood from a theoretical perspective. So they observe that various kinds of indexes and various physical representations of data, they, they behave like views. Now, uh, second application is in data integration. How come? What is data integration actually? What is the goal of the data of data integration? Yes? You have a bunch of disparate repositories of information and you'd like to bring them together so you could query them without having to worry about all of the different ones? Exactly. So to take disparate uh, sources of information and to offer a single unified mediated schema. The, the term is mediated schema. Gives the illusion that there is a single database. Uh, but when we, when we formulate queries over this database, those queries they need to be rewritten in terms of the, of the physical, um, uh, of the physical um, information sources. Is there a question there at Microsoft? OK, I, I, thought I, I saw a hand. Um, so, so that's a connection. So now we have uh, this mediated schema that might, not, uh, that might not be populated. It's only a virtual representation of the integrated uh, uh, data. And, and all the physical, the, the, the real sources, they are described as views over the mediated schema. And the task of, of a query answering using views is to take a query over the mediated schema that's, that's issued by the application and to re rewrite this into queries over the sources where the data can be extracted from. Okay, any more questions about this paper? 
Okay, we postpone questions until the final. Yes? So you said there was a, in, in the conclusion, that there was kind of an existing gap between the two styles that we talked about. Uh, and I didn't understand. Like you said, the, the, the first approach was very bad with uh, a large number of views. And that uh, I just didn't understand that. The, the uh, gov versus love. Are you referring to these two keywords? Global as view versus local as view? Problem answering queries using views uh, raises a multitude of challenges ranging from the theoretical blah blah blah. Um, well, the algorithm uh, for answering queries using views are um, are already being incorporated in commercial systems. Uh, Maybe we should take this. Yeah, offline. I'll take it offline. Okay. No, that's okay. Yeah, it's great to have a discussion, but we need more participation, I guess. Then I have a more concrete questions, but I really would like everyone to participate. This is about reviewing the material we covered last, last week. Uh, what is the schedule? Who can tell me what the schedule is? In concurrency control, this is a topic of our investigation, the schedule. What is the schedule? Yes. Order of reads and writes to the database? Yeah, it's a order, order of, of uh, reads and writes to the database, perfect. But there is a, uh, uh, each read and write needs to be characterized by two things. Wh by what? It's the uh, read to the like buffer or memory and read to the di or disk and memory. But, uh, so we need the, the element name. The element is like the page or the record. And we need to know something else. Which transaction did that read? And that's all we need to know. A sequence of reads and writes, uh, and for each of them we need to know which transaction and what element is being read or written. Uh, and the schedule essentially represents an interleaving of these operations coming from different transactions. Perfect. What is a serializable schedule? That's basic. Everybody should know, uh, you know, 30 years from now you should know what, what a serializable schedule is. What is it? It's a schedule that is equivalent to a serial schedule. But what is a serial schedule? Yes? It's a schedule in which multiple transactions are run one after the other. Exactly. It's a schedule in which first we run one transaction, then the, the, the next transaction, then the next transaction. That's a serial schedule. And if our interleaving is equivalent to some serial schedule, then we call it serializable. Okay, so looking at a schedule, what do we call a conflict? Dependence between two transactions. A dependence between two transactions? Uh, how should this dependence be? Uh, read, write, read, uh, write, read, or uh, write, write. Right, and I actually found that the book has a wonderful way to uh, summarize this. It's uh, any pair of, of operations of which one, of, one is a write. Okay. If one of them is a right, then you have um, then you have a conflict. And moreover, they have to be to the same element. So let's backtrack. A conflict is a pair of operations in a schedule uh, done by uh, uh, done by two different transactions to the same element, of which one is a, at least one is a right. And what is what the conflict essentially says is that you can't. You can't swap the order of those two transactions. They are, they are given by what, what we see in the schedule, by that uh, conflict order. <coughs> so what is a conflict serializable schedule? Has no loops uh, and conflict dependencies between transactions? It, uh, that is one way to test it. It's a schedule where there are no loops in the, I always forget this, uh, the, the precedent graph. The term is precedence graph. That, that's, uh, that is a, the theorem that characterizes um, conflict serializable schedules, but we did not define them like this. How did we define them? It's a schedule that has conflicts, but we can find the serializable schedule. 
So we can find the serial schedule uh, by swapping adjacent operations that are not in conflict. So we, we swap them, we are sure that uh, this will not affect the semantics of the schedule. And if we end up with a serial schedule, then we call, uh, we call it a conflict serializable schedule. Okay, so now let's get to the hard part. What is a view serializable schedule? Is every view serializable schedule also conflict serializable or vice versa? Let's start with a simpler, simpler question. Question. Every view serializable schedule is conflict serializable. No, it's not, it's false. It's the opposite. Every conflict serializable schedule is view serializable. So what is a view serializable schedule? Serializable is, I mean, you can find the serializable schedule, but... Serial schedule? On, serial schedule based on certain data, certain properties of the data that you process. Okay, so let's, let's do this together. So we look at a schedule, we call it view serializable. If there exists a serial schedule, such that this serial schedule is in some sense equivalent to our, uh, is, is so-called view equivalent to our initial schedule. What does view equivalent mean? It's not, it's not, we don't get from one to the other by swapping. No more swapping. We have conflicts, but these conflicts don't result in, in result actually in equivalence because the data conflicts don't affect the final. Right, so we can't get from one to the other by swapping uh, uh, because there will be conflicts that cannot be resolved. However, these two are view equivalent. And what, what was the example that we gave? Uh, two, two consecutive writes in different transactions for the same value. Two consecutive writes, um, um, well. For, well, there were two writes, they weren't exactly. So, so suppose, suppose, we ha suppose we have two rights, and there is a third right that overrides what both of them did. Then we can swap them, provided that nobody has read uh, the, the result of the, the, the first right that was overwritten by the second right. But in it, if in the end everything is overwritten by a third right, then we can swap them. So the definition of a, of, of a uh, view serializable schedule uh, it's more, it's longer. You have to read the, the, the slides, but it's also defined in the book, in our textbook, in the main textbook. Uh, but it essentially captures the following intuition, that uh, two schedules are view equivalent. If uh, every, every transaction that reads an element in, in the first schedule, if it reads the element written by some other transaction, then it reads the, 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 the same value in the other schedule. From, uh, it reads the value of the element written by exactly the same transaction. It, in, a, in essence, if you can uh, show that the two in, in both schedules, every every read uh, is is for for this uh, ends up reading the same value, and moreover, the end result, the result after finishing the transaction for every element is the same in the two schedules. I have a much nicer formulation on the slides, so um, it didn't come out nicely. But the, you, 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 I hope you, are, you get the right intuition behind the view, uh, view serializable schedule. Okay, so now it gets really hairy. What is a recoverable schedule? It's about aborts. When schedules, when, when, when a transaction wants to abort, uh, what do we worry about when a transaction wants to abort? Right, so maybe, maybe it has written something, then another transaction has read that thing, and now our transaction aborts. So what do we need to do with the second transaction that has read? We need to abort it, right? If it, if it, if it read something that uh, uh, was dirty, which was a dirty read. 
uh, and, and the transaction who wrote that value aborts. Then we need to abort the dirty, the, the transaction that writes the dirty read. What can go wrong? When is it the case that we cannot abort that transaction? Not the transaction committed. Exactly. If it already committed and we gave out the money, then we are in trouble. Right? So transaction one uh, uh, writes writes a value A, then transaction two reads A, and transaction two commits. And now transaction one wants to abort. So this is not a recovery rate schedule. Because we, we, we can't we can't abort um, we can't we can't abort transaction one. So what is a recoverable schedule? It's a schedule in which whenever a transaction commits, like T2, then all the transactions whose values this T2 read have already committed. So in order to make this transaction here recoverable, uh, what needs to happen? We can't allow T2 to commit until T1 commits or aborts. If it aborts, then we are going to abort T2 as well. And if it commits, then we are going to allow it to commit. I know it was late last, last time when we discussed this, and so, but I really insist that now uh, um, everybody's uh, uh, on the same page with uh, recoverable, recoverable schedules. Are recoverable schedules clear? Then what is a schedule that avoids cascading aborts? The other more stricter condition. Yeah, what, what are they? Um, well, a schedule that uh, no reads come from uncommitted transactions. Exactly. Uh, let's put it in a positive way. Whenever a transaction wants to read, the value it, it reads must be written by a transaction that already committed. So if you look back at, at my example here at the top, which I realize is not very uh, nicely written, what needs to happen to, to call this a um, schedule that avoids cascading aborts? You can't read A before T1 commits. Exactly. You can't read A before read, uh, T1 commits. So you, you're waiting even earlier for T1 to commit. It's even a stricter condition. OK. So with these uh, definitions fresh in, in mind, now let's let's talk about how to uh, uh, how to implement a scheduler. A scheduler is is um, um, it's, a, it's a module that uh, simply um, w um, watches for for requests from the transactions for read and write requests and decides who goes next, decides who's allowed to proceed and who has to wait or maybe uh, who needs to be aborted. There are two approaches to schedulers. Uh, the pessimistic scheduler is the one uh, that we are going to discuss first. Uh, this is based on locks. Uh, and I suppose everybody knows what locks are. And then um, either towards the end of this lecture or next Wednesday, we will discuss uh, much more fun schedulers. They are called optimistic schedulers uh, that use uh, timestamps or validation or snapshot isolation, which is a term you probably have, have heard, snapshot isolation. So what I'm going to do over the next uh, half an hour or an hour is discuss a locking scheduler, which is a very simple uh, idea. The idea is that every element that can be read or written uh, has an associated lock. And if a transaction wants to read it or to write it, it needs to acquire that lock. Uh, if it cannot uh, acquire the lock, because the lock is acquired by a different transaction, it's doing something to that element, then the transaction has to wait. And when the lock becomes available, then the transaction may, uh, is go going to be to get the lock, and then it can proceed. Let me ask you this. Does everyone know here what a lock is? Should, should we repeat uh, the definition of a lock? Any Okay, so then I, I, will assume, I will assume that everyone knows what, what a lock is. Um, and um, 
for the examples I'm going to give next, the notations are uh, L, uh, Li of A means acquire the lock. I think I'm going to use uppercase mostly. And Ui means unlock. So lock and unlock. OK, so let's take an example. Remember our uh, non-serializable schedule. Here are two transactions. Uh, the first wants to add 100 to A, and then wants to add 100 to, to B. And the second wants to multiply uh, A by 2 and to multiply B by 2. So if they were to run in isolation, remember I from acid, uh, Acid, uh, I means isolation. It means that uh, the transactions should, the effect of the transactions should be such as if they were executing an isolation on the database. Well, if T, if T1 were to execute an isolation, then uh, if you run it on a database where A and B are equal, then at the end of the execution, A or B are still equal, right? They are just increased by 100. Similarly, if you execute it to an isolation, uh, you start with AB uh, equals to B, you end up with A equals to B. But if you interleave them like that, then we are in big trouble. Then A and B are no longer uh, equal. So obviously, transactions, they not, have not executed an isolation. And this is a non-serializable schedule. Good. So I hope this refreshed your memory. Here is how locks solve the problem. Uh, before we read, um, T1 must acquire, the, must acquire the lock. So then it reads A, it writes A. Uh, when it's done, then it can unlock. Uh, and now it wants to work on B. So um, in order to work on B, it's going to require the lock uh, uh, on B. In the meantime, the scheduler decides, um, you know, you, you spend too much time here. So why don't you um, stop for a while? Uh, I'm going to schedule transaction two now. And transaction two uh, requires a lock on A, reads A, writes A, uh, now um, unlocks A. And now it would like to move on and do uh, the operation on B. But when it tries to require the lock on B, it's going to be put on in a waiting list. It's going to wait for uh, this lock to be released, because the lock is already acquired, acquired by transaction one. So therefore, uh, transaction one proceeds. Uh, it unlocks B, and now uh, transaction one, transaction two can continue, and uh, life is good. If you look at the schedule, this is a serializable schedule. Right? We have prevented the non-serializable schedule on the previous slide. Everybody's with me? Because now I'm going to show you something quite surprising. Yep. See, my is next the, slide starts is with the transaction two takes the lock B transaction one is having lock A. transaction two takes the lock B when? Transaction one is having lock A. And what if I is like the end? Yep. That's exactly the problem. So that's that's exactly she she started with but she had a comment starting with but, and my, I just want to emphasize, my slide also starts with but. Um, that's exactly the issue. Uh, maybe um, we, the, schedule, the scheduler switched to transaction two before, before transaction one got a chance to acquire the lock on B. So now, when transaction two wants to acquire the lock on B, it's OK. It can proceed. It can proceed. It's going to unlock B. And now transaction 1 proceeds. But is this a, is this a, a serializable schedule? No. No, that's exactly our non-serializable schedule. Now, if you think about this, this is actually quite bad news. Uh, locks, you know them probably from operating systems. Locks are supposed to be the magic, right? Locks are supposed to uh, prevent. Uh, multiple multiple um, uh, threads or multiple processes or multiple transactions to access um, the same the same resource at the same time. But look, they did not do the job. They pre they did not prevent. Uh, they do not ensure that the resulting schedule is serializable. Okay, so how do we fix this? 
Yeah. yeah. Do I have a question? Add a, add a locking lock so that you can do your unlocking and locking of B as an atomic operation. So, because if unlocking A and locking B were themselves in a locked space. Ah, that actually that could work here. But I wonder if this generalizes to three uh, to three elements. Maybe if you have three elements, I'm not sure it works. Our main goal is to keep A and B equal. Mm -hmm. Then shouldn't the lock be both on A and B? Ah, that's a, that's a good idea. But you, in, in practice, you cannot implement a lock on pairs of uh, because every transaction may want to read uh, to read several several elements, uh, and you don't have a, a lock for every every subset. Yes. You can't uh, you can't lock every variable being used by a transaction when it starts. Okay. You can do this. You're, you're definitely heading. Ev everybody seems to be heading in the right direction. Uh, let me show you what the buzzword is, and you'll, you will recognize this. Uh, the technique that ensures serializability is called two-phase locking, 2PL. I'm sure you have heard about this. Uh, and the rule in, in 2PL is that all the lock requests must precede all the unlock requests. So in other words, you're not allowed to unlock. Uh, once you start unlocking, then uh, you're no, no longer allowed to lock anything. Okay? Uh, if you look back here, um, this rule, is, this, this, this rule is, is violated because transaction one unlocks A and then later wants to lock B. So, so the, the, this here is not a two-phase locking. Does, does it make sense? Window, right? Sorry? Okay, so we have suppose n number of elements. Mm -hmm. We are locking one to n. The other one can start from n to one. And we might the other one might get more. Time. So ah, that's an interesting phenomenon. So here here is what she says. One transaction wants to lock elements one to n. So it's going to lock them. One, two, three, four, five. So transaction two wants to lock the same elements, it goes in the opposite order. N n minus one, n minus two. What happens here? Do we get a non-serializable schedule? You get a deadlock. We get a deadlock. That's a different, um, uh, it's, a, it's a big headache, but it's a different headache. I'm going to talk about this later. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm only uh, worried about uh, ensuring that the schedule is serializable. If we get a deadlock, then we don't get a schedule at all. We just block, we get a stop, yeah. So yes. one. I believe she was saying that it spends some time in the middle where there's nothing locked at all, right? Uh, in this case, yeah. Tran tra uh, transaction one doesn't hold any locks. So, yeah, you can totally mess things up that way. Totally? Yes, because um, well, transaction comes and it changes state under uh, the transaction one and causes all sorts of uh, problems. Yeah, I think I think we agree. This is a bad. This is a bad schedule here. What what happens here? The the interesting thing uh, is that with with this very simple rule, we can guarantee that uh, I mean that we the scheduler will guarantee that the resulting schedule is serializable. And that's actually quite amazing. It's not a necessary. It's, this is not the only rule that can guarantee serializability. I will uh, briefly mention a second one. Uh, but this is what works. It's simple, and this is what database systems implement. Yes. So that means that anything that locks early in a transaction is going, you're going to hold that lock a lot longer. Exactly. That that is. So let me repeat what he said. This means that if you uh, if you place if you lock something early in the transaction, you are going to hold on to that lock, uh, basically most likely until the end of the transaction. So are there any other equally valid, but uh, more optimized for a short lock time uh, methods? So uh, to my knowledge, there is no other um, um, strategy that ensures serializability. What, what, uh, what database systems do, they uh, relax the, um, the serializability requirement. They have weak uh, isolation levels, and we are going to talk about them today. I hope we, are, uh, we definitely need to get to them today. And I, I will show you what, what happens there. But if, we, if serializability is our golden standard, then um, 
we have to implement two-phase locking. Again, it's not the only way you can, uh, if, if, you, if you want to, to you know, investigate the theory of serializability, uh, it's not necessary that you do this through two-phase locking. Uh, but it's a simple rule that works. So, what so let's, let's see this in action. Yes, there is a question. Yeah, so what happens if the transaction two is reversed in order? First B, then A. And the lock for B is not acquired until, uh, well, the same way as it was in one of the slides, where so, you lock B only after, right before you unlock A. So it's still 2PL safe, mm -hmm. but still, but would that not cause problems? Uh, let's actually examine 2PL because we haven't uh, looked at the slide yet. This is a slide that illustrates 2PL. Uh, let me describe it first, and then I'll come to your question. So um, here, um, we uh, in, in T1, I decided to lock both of them at the beginning. And when we are done with A, we can unlock A. And later, when we are done with B, we unlock B. Uh, and now, um, when, when transaction 2 would like to lock B, uh, it's going to be denied, because this lock is, hold, is held and therefore it's going to uh, wait until transaction one finishes and then it's going to unlock both of them. And now the schedule is, uh, is serializable. <coughs> so getting back to your question, you wanted to lock them in a different order? So if you move lock B lower for the transaction one, L1B, you move it lower, yes, and you move you unlock as well together with it, so they're both a little lower, and then you move the second half of the transaction two before the first half. So you move B before A. Uh, you you want this, the, this whole thing to be moved earlier? Yeah, yeah moved up above, yes. Uh, be, uh, before, yes. Be, be, before transaction one, oh, you might get a deadlock in this case. Because trans, you, you want transaction one to acquire the lock on A first, and then transaction two will acquire the lock on B. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then, then you're, you're in a deadlock because each of them will wait for a lock from the other transaction. Okay. So 2 p does not prevent deadlocks, it only prevents conflicts. Uh, 2 pl ensures serializability, it does not prevent deadlocks. And actually, uh, nothing prevents deadlocks. Uh, uh, we'll discuss this in a, in, in a, in a few slides. Uh, th there are techniques that can prevent deadlocks, but they are expensive and they are not, uh, they are not worse. Mm -hmm. yeah the effort. Good, so let me make this a formal statement. Two-phase locking guarantees that the resulting schedule is serializable. Proof. Let's prove this. Suppose not. Suppose we run two-phase locking and something bad happens, like in our example when we, uh, we used locks, but the resulting schedule was not serializable. Well, if the resulting schedule is not serializable, it's not conflict serializable, I didn't read this, but it, it guarantees conflict serializability. If the resulting schedule is not conflict serializable, then there is a cycle in the uh, precedence graph. And the cycle can be long. Uh, I illustrated here a cycle of length three. So let's examine this cycle and let's prove that such a cycle cannot exist. There must be a contradiction there. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start by looking at uh, at this conflict. If we have an arrow from T1 to T2 in the precedence graph, it means that there is a conflict in the schedule between some operation done by T1 and some <coughs> operation done by T2, and and the element is written here. Now uh, in two-phase locking. The rule is that T1 must have acquired a lock on A, and only after T1 releases a lock can T2, um, can T2 do something to A, can, can it acquire the lock on A. And this is why I wrote this, um, uh, this first line, and because of the exclusivity of the lock, we have this first line here, that, um, that transaction one must release a lock before transaction two acquires a lock. Is this first line clear why I wrote it there? So it, it means that the, the moment 
the, the, the time when the transaction 1 releases a lock on A must precede the time when transaction 2 acquires a lock on A. Uh, did, did you have a question here? Good. Now let's look at the second line. I'm claiming that uh, um, a, the time when transaction 2 acquires a lock on A strictly precedes the time when transaction 2 unlocks B. Why? Definition of two-phase locking. Two locking, exactly. This is because of 2PL. And only because of 2PL. Okay, so now we, we are one step further. So we, we, un we are unlocked B. Now let's look at what happens when we unlock B. Look at the second conflict. Transaction 3 had a conflict uh, on B with transaction 2. And uh, transaction 3 came later. So therefore, uh, when transaction 3 acquires a lock on, on B, this can only be after transaction 2 has released a lock. So why is this um, a temporal ordering here? Because of mutual exclusion. Because this is what locks ensure. You can't, uh, you can't acquire the lock uh, on B un until the previous transaction has released a lock. OK, uh, we have a long cycle here of length, of length 3. Um, now I'm making this claim that um, transaction 2 releases a lock on B before, sorry, transaction 2 uh, acquires a lock on B before it releases a lock on C. Why? Yes? 2PL. 2PL. So this is because of 2PL. Uh, and from here on, this is the same thing. So uh, tran there is this conflict from T2, T from T3 to T2. Uh, and because of that, the unlocking C must precede uh, locking uh, C by 1. This is because mutual exclusion. And finally, because of 2PL, uh, 1 must, um, um, must first acquire the lock on C before it releases the lock on A. Now, everything I underlined here uh, means, in, uh, means that the, the time when the operation on the left happened is strictly smaller than the time when the operation on the right happened. But look, we have a cycle. This can't, can't happen in time. This is not a cycle in the precedence graph. This is a cycle in time. And we, don't, we can't have a cycle in time. So this is a proof that uh, two-phase locking guarantees serializability. Any questions about this proof? I think it's, it's insightful, and it, one, some, something to, to um, look for when you see a proof is, is where is this extra assumption used? Did we use the fact that the, the schedule is, uh, is a 2PL um, schedule? Yes, we used it in several places. Okay, but now we have a completely new problem. We are running 2PL, and look what transaction 1 wants to do. It wants to abort. Transaction one aborts. So what is wrong with this schedule? It is 2PL. The locks happen here. The unlocks happen here. Um, here are the locks, and here are the unlocks. Uh, it is serializable. Yes? So you just have to add in a similar constraint, right, where you can't abort. Uh, after you've started unlocking. Yeah, but uh, first let me let me uh, bring everyone to the same page. The problem here is that um, that the, the second the second transaction has read a value a that was written by transaction one, and actually it also read uh, the value b written by transaction one. But these values they will be undone when the transaction aborts. Um, the transaction manager will undo those actions and will restore the values to their uh, original values. Uh, and now we are in trouble because transaction 2 
uh, has read them. Okay, and moreover, things can actually go even, even worse. If, if, the, if transaction two commits before transaction one aborts, then we are in big trouble because then we can't, we can't abort it to anymore. So th does everyone understand the consequence of this example? Two-phase locking guarantees ser ser serializability, that's fine, but the resulting schedules may not be recoverable. We can't run them. And the fix, again, is extremely simple. So this just summarizes. Uh, the fix is very simple. Uh, the, the policy that database systems apply is called strict two-phase locking. And they add a simple rule, which is uh, transactions are not allowed to, un to unlock until the end. Unlocking happens atomically with commit or with abort. Okay, so if you go back to our example, this one here, um, this schedule will no longer be possible because these two unlocks, they need to be done at the very end when the transaction commits or aborts. And therefore, this will prevent T2 from uh, reading dirty data. Okay, uh, so uh, what, what is interesting about strict 2 pl uh, the schedule is guaranteed to be recoverable. And in fact, it's, it's guaranteed to avoid casco cascading aborts. <coughs> Remember, in cascading, uh, a schedule that avoids cascading aborts ensures that whenever a transaction reads a value, the transaction that, that wrote that value has already committed. We know that in 2PL that transaction must have committed because otherwise it would not have released a lock. It's going to hang on to its lock until it commits. So this is why it avoids, it avoids cascading upwards. It's actually even more. This, this schedule is called strict, which I didn't define, but here is something fun for you to do. Read in the book what a strict schedule is. Uh, it's even more restricted than avoiding cascading, cascading upwards. And it turns out that the schedule is enforced by uh, strict two-phase locking are guaranteed to be strict. So this is what database systems do. They, they uh, use uh, locks, but with, with strict two-phase locking, in which uh, locks can be acquired at any time, but they are, they are held until the end of the transaction. They are only released when the transaction commits or aborts. Okay, any questions about strict two-phase locking? Yes. Again, there's, there seems to be this kind of contention between the desire to have very short transactions and this, uh, which pushes the, uh, the, the length of the locks out even more. And so the example we had a couple weeks ago where some guy had transactions that lasted several months mm -hmm. seems more and more dangerous. So is it, it's all on the application developers then to ensure that transactions uh, close promptly and that transactions are small? Yeah, this, this is this is on the application developer. Um, but there is also an, another another. Um, there are there is also the other class of uh, uh, from currency control mechanisms, which are the optimistic ones. Uh, but usually, they uh, they prevent schedules from happening. They don't they don't allow more schedules. So in, in some sense, the the, the, two, the strict two two phase locking is the most um, um, the most general um, scheduling mechanism that, that, that exists that ensures serializability. So yeah, uh, it's, it's up to the programmer to, uh, and to the database administrator who controls admission control, how many transactions are allowed to run concurrently on the system. Okay, so more, more thoughts about locks. Uh, we discussed a single kind of lock, uh, no matter if transactions want to read or write them. Now you probably know this, uh, it, uh, it makes much more sense to have two kinds of locks. Uh, shared locks, which are used for reading, and exclusive locks, which are used for writing. So what's the rule? Uh, if I hold a shared, shared lock, 
and uh, and he wants to read. Is he going to wait for me? No. Uh, shared locks are not in conflict with each other. But if I hold the shared lock and she wants to write, what happens? Then she will wait until I release my shared lock. Uh, what happens if several if several transactions hold the shared lock and she wants to write? Then, uh, then she will wait for all of them to, to finish, to terminate. Uh, and, and vice versa, if she holds the, the, the exclusive lock and somebody and we want to read, we all have to wait until she finishes with the exclusive lock. It's very simple. Uh, so then there are other kind of locks that uh, some database systems uh, uh, support. And some, one is called an update lock, which start li starts like a shared lock, and then <coughs> you can escalate to, a, to an exclusive lock. So you can, you can uh, tolerate for the big, during the beginning of your transaction, uh, you can uh, allow other transactions to read this element, but at some point you want to update it, and then you uh, re uh, acquire an, an exclusive lock. Um, there is even there is even um, um, something called an increment lock, which allows uh, for comm commutative operations. So I can increment, and you can increment, and we can switch the order, and it's still fine because increment um, increments they commute. Uh, yeah, so database systems, they go to a great length to try to, min to reduce this number of the, the, the contention on, uh, on common elements. Other techniques are to control the granularity of the lock. Uh, locks can be of a fine granularity. They can be just for, the, for a record, which is kind of the logical thing to do. But if you do this, then the data structure uh, that maintains all the active locks is, is very large and it's, it, it is uh, expensive to, um, uh, to access. So then uh, any, every uh, lock request or, or, uh, or every unlock request is going to be more expensive. Uh, the alternative is to use coarse grain locking, so locking on entire tables. And actually what database systems do, they have both kinds of locks and they, uh, they escalate, they do lock escalation, which means you, you held Maybe you, you have a read lock on, on a table, and now you narrow down into a write lock on a record. Um, or vice versa, you do, what's the right term? The opposite of escalation. Uh, Descalation? I don't think yeah. so. Descalation? Okay, so I, I do not, I, I should be honest, I do not understand the details of how, how these locks are, are used, but the principle is it's pretty straightforward. They try to minimize the contention. Okay, deadlocks. Everybody in this room and in the other room wanted to talk about deadlocks. So let's talk about deadlocks. Uh, so the deadlock is when there is a cycle in the waits for graph. Uh, transaction one waits for, uh, um, for uh, a lock that is held by transaction two. And transaction two waits, not necessarily by something held by transaction one, by, by a different transaction. But in the end, you, you end up with a cycle. And then you have a deadlock. Deadlocks are, are bad. Uh, it's, they are one of the um, unpleasant consequences of using locks in order to, uh, to, do, con to do concurrency control. There are two ways to, de to deal with them. Uh, what database systems do is this, the second one. Deadlock detection, uh, what do they do? They have some timeouts. Uh, uh, if a transaction doesn't make progress in a certain amount of time, then the, the um, assume that it's deadlocked, or they trigger a more expensive algorithm that uh, con constructs this weights for graph of all the transactions. They want to have a, a clear picture of who waits for what. And in this graph, they look for a cycle. And if there is a cycle, then we know uh, there is a deadlock, and we know uh, that we need to, to abort one of these transactions on the cycle. And that's exactly what they do they abort a transaction on, uh, on, on this cycle. Uh, I know the SQL Server has an, an interesting strategy for uh, how often to run uh, this deadlock detection algorithm. It runs this every, I used to know this, 10 seconds or, or 5 seconds. Does, does anyone know how often SQL Server runs it 
deadlock detection algorithm by default. Periodically. Sorry? Periodically. Periodically, but I, I, I used to know the exact um, per period, and I think it's about 10 seconds or so. But the interesting thing is that if it detects cycles, then it decreases uh, uh, the period because it assumes that the system is, is uh, uh, overloaded, and this is why there was a cycle. So with high probability, there will be an, another cycle um, after a short period of time. And whenever it, det it detects a cycle, any system uh, will choose a, a transaction in this cycle uh, and abort it and hope that now there is no more cycle. Uh, in order to try to, to uh, avoid um, um, uh, deadlocks, one strategy would be to acquire all the locks at, at the beginning. If you, if, you, if you know what elements you're going to read or write, then if you acquire all the locks at the beginning, then you don't create these, uh, these cycles. But uh, sometimes that's not possible. Uh, because we don't know what the um, application code will do, what elements it's, it's going to read or write. The, the theory that guarantees deadlock avoidance is to order, is to have an, an order on all elements, and to uh, strictly enforce that locks are, require, are acquired in this order, and, and this guarantees uh, no deadlocks. But what does what what would that mean in the context of databases? Uh, it it works if you can make it work. Uh, it means that you have to uh, consider a global order on all the records in your database, and if a transaction wants to to acquire a lock on on record number fifty thousand, uh, once it gets that lock, you're not allowed to go backwards. You're not allowed it. You, you won't allow it to uh, request a lock on, trans, on record number thirty thousand. Uh, it's only allowed to increase uh, the the element number that for which it acquires a lock. It's completely impractical. Uh, you can't. You cannot implement this uh, total order on uh, uh, in a database setting. So this is why database systems they are stuck with uh, that lock de detection and with aborting a transaction whenever a deadlock is detected. One question. Second one is what we're doing in OPS. Sorry? The second one in deadlock avoidance acting on locks at once. That's what we're doing in OPS locking. Ah, uh, that's, that's actually, let me ask this to everyone. She said this, acquiring all lock at once. No. Is this, is this 2PL is it, or is this strict 2PL? Is this strict 2PL? What does strict to PL say? It says that we have to, to unlock everything at the end. But it doesn't say when we lock them. We can, we can lock at any time. But in strict to PL, we, we, we are forced to, to uh, hold the locks until we commit. This is the opposite. This says uh, you should actually acquire all the locks at the beginning in one single atomic uh, operation. And th that's, that's more difficult to, uh, to enforce. <coughs> Which actually begs a question. When you write an application uh, and you update the database, you don't worry about locks. And your Java code or your C sharp code uh, will simply issue uh, update or insert or, or, or delete statements uh, to the database. No, uh, no locks. Where are these locks coming from? Who places these locks? That is the transaction manager. So the transaction manager, uh, it has actually two functions, uh, or the locking scheduler. It has two functions. The first one, task one, is that it needs to, to insert the lock requests, the locks and unlocks. So how does it know to do this? It's actually very simple. Whenever, whenever uh, the, the, your application code uh, requires a, re, a read or a write, then the, the locking scheduler will first insert there a, a, a lock request for the, for the lock corresponding to that element. So, so therefore, 
if you imagine the sequence of, of operations of the transaction, the locks are actually inserted right before the read or right before the write. And this ensures strict, strict 2PL because it will never release them until the very end. Uh, it, it just acquires the locks and when the transaction commits, then it will issue a global release, a global unlock for all the locks held by the transaction. So it's a very, it's a really a very simple way to, to uh, enforce locking. And I, I hope you have this picture in mind. Try to imagine, try to imagine yourself implementing the locking uh, uh, scheduler. You just have to monitor the requests done by the transactions. And whenever there is a, there is a read request or, the, or a write request, you inject a locking uh, operation uh, right at the beginning. And whenever there, there is a commit or abort request, you do all the unlocks. Yes? So the, I've seen one example in MySQL where you can get a write lock up front if you do a select for update. And I just want to mention it because it, it seems like it's one of the few places where I've seen where you kind of have, have access to a more serious form of locking up front. So you could almost do the, uh, you get all your locks up front, uh, deadlock avoidance. I see. So, uh, so you're, you're referring to a program in practice. Okay. But my, my, my SQL has this thing you can select for update, and it gets, a, it gets write locks. I see. So it's, it's not a program in practice. It's actually an, a, a command. A command in my SQL, yes. Uh -huh. But it also suggests a good, if you, if you didn't have that, then you could issue in a dummy update at the very beginning to acquire all the locks. Like that's just a, a common SQL thing, not specific to MySQL. Ah, I see. So, um, uh, 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 what, what's the name again? Uh, select for update. Select for update. So, what, uh, what, uh, what we had a comment here in this room that there is a command called select for update uh, that you could issue at the beginning of the transaction, and then it will. Uh, the the effect is that it will acquire all the logs for that particular update. And they are write locks, I suppose, exclu exclusive locks. If you uh, what's, the down, what's the downside of doing this? Why not do this? If you roll back. If you roll back, it's the responsibility of the transaction manager to ensure that you roll back. I mean, it's, it's an exclusive lock, so that means no one else can read from that point on. Exactly. The, the downside is you're reducing the amount of concurrency in your system. Because once you acquire these locks, nobody else can read them. Did you have a, a comment here and I interrupted you? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, for update will lock, or it'll put an exclusive update lock on all rows returned from a select. Right, so they will put an, an exclusive lock on all these rows. Uh, if, you do, if you don't do this, maybe there is a chance that other transactions might proceed in the meantime. What other way do we have to put an exclusive lock? Right? Just for update. And we want to block the other transactions. Is there any other way to do it? So, so is there any other way to, to, uh, to do it if you, do, if you want to update? Uh, the, the alternative is to postpone uh, acquiring the lock until the moment when you actually need it. What this select for update does is that it forces uh, uh, the locks to be acquired at the beginning of the transaction. And the alternative is to wait, uh, to, to let the locks be acquired only when you do the actual update which could be significantly later in the transaction, if the transaction is long. Okay, so this is one thing that the locking scheduler needs to do. Uh, on the other hand, it needs to enforce uh, the lock semantics. Uh, and for this, you have to picture yourself, uh, um, you know, uh, having to talk to, uh, to, to the transactions and to the database system. So you need to know which transactions hold what locks, and whenever a, uh, a lock is acquired or, or uh, released, uh, you need to update a data structure that maintains uh, uh, for each transaction the set of locks or for each element the set of transactions holding uh, or waiting for that particular, particular lock. Uh, the lock table, this is big, and it's a critical data structure in any database system. This is a table where uh, the, the information about logs is stored. Uh, it has to be in main, mem main memory table. And uh, it's, um, uh, this is where most of, m much of the time goes. 
uh, when a transaction wants to acquire a lock, uh, even if the lock is granted, there is a, a significant overhead uh, to just update this data structure to record the fact that now the transaction holds a lock on this, uh, on this element. Okay, so um, here is a great picture that I uh, essentially copied from the book. This, this shows you a representation of um, the performance of the locking, uh, of a locking scheduler as a function of uh, the number of transactions in the system. So initially, if there are no transactions, then the throughput is pretty good in the sense that if you have one transaction that wants to execute, it's going to go through it at full speed. Actually, what is throughput? How would you define the throughput of a database system? It's actually measured in TPM. What does TPM mean? Or TPS? Transactions per second. Transactions per second. So this is how many transactions per second it can, it can serve. Uh, think about uh, what we could, um, like a banking system. How many, how many transactions per second can it serve? The more, the better, because it means it can serve more customers. Uh, and and this, is, um, this is the throughput of the, and, and as a function of the number of transactions. Uh, you expect that as a, the number of requests increases, the throughput should increase because now we have more, more requests. But at some point, it doesn't increase anymore. It flattens and it's actually worse. It starts to decrease. You're, you're asking for more transactions, but it actually the number of transactions that are, that are executed decreases, per, per second decreases. Why? What, what happens behind the scenes? Why, uh, why can't the system keep up with the increased number of transaction requests? Uncommitted transactions go up. The number of uncommitted transactions go up. So you're, more, you're trying to keep more in memory of that cash, perhaps. So they, they are waiting. For what are they waiting? They're waiting for locks. Now more transactions hold locks, uh, and they're waiting for each other. Something even worse might happen. Perhaps the uh, global uh, main shared area. A deadlock. Maybe there is a deadlock. And if there is, if there is a deadlock, then the system has to abort some transactions, and the throughput decreases even further. So uh, if you're a database administrator, this is your sweet spot. You want to be here. You don't want to admit more transactions than the system can handle. And of course, it's difficult to tune this. You, you, you don't know. It depends on your workload. OK, so I mentioned uh, that a strict two-phase locking is not the only uh, way to guarantee serializability. I'm going to mention one more uh, because it is, it is uh, described in the book. Uh, and it's also, uh, this is a way Database, system, database systems handle uh, locks to uh, tree-like structures, for example, indexes. When you need to update uh, uh, an index, an index is, is a tree. And it looks something like this. So you, uh, if you do an update, you first want to read the record. So you would traverse a tree um, top down to get to the uh, to the corresponding leaf, uh, and whenever you read a node, of course you need to acquire the lock on that node. So now look look at what happens. All the transactions, all these hundreds or thousands of transactions per second, they all contend for one particular thing. For what? You know, another transaction might not want to read the same, the same element. Maybe the other transaction goes this way. So is there any contention? The root node. For the root node. Everybody wants to go here. There is a hype. Sorry? Read it is shared. If it's read, read it is shared. But if you do an update, if these transactions want to update, uh, we will uh, study uh, B trees. In the worst case, the node uh, it can split up to the highest level. It happens very rarely, but you know you don't know when, when it happens. So you need to acquire all the locks in order to ensure that you can split the node. 
so th and, and updates are quite frequent, even if they are in different places uh, of the uh, leaves of the tree. So database systems, they do not impl implement two -phase, strict two-phase locking for accessing trees. They implement a different protocol, which is also a lot of fun. It's called, um, it's called the tree protocol. And I think I describe it on the next slide. But let me show it here. It says uh, something like this. Uh, you're holding the lock on a node of a tree. You can acquire, uh, you can acquire an, a lock on, a, on, a, on any of its children. And then you can release a lock. So it's, it goes like in, in, in two phases, like, like this. Uh, in fact, the rule is written differently. It says that in order to acquire the lock on any node of the tree, you first must have a, a lock on the parent. But once you have it, you can release it, because you can go further down the tree. <coughs> so this doesn't quite solve the, the, the splitting problem. Uh, when we know I need to go uh, back, back back up and split, and uh, this is something I need to discuss when we discuss B trees. But I can tell you what the trick is: uh, they split aggressively. If the root is full, then they split it uh, because they don't want to hold the lock until they come back, uh, and they, they apply the same rule for every single node. So um, the in order to avoid contention for the root and the upper levels of the tree. Uh, the uh, database systems, they split aggressively uh, nodes in the B tree that are for. Yes? What if you took, for example, a uh, highly uh, high traffic uh, table and had multiple nodes uh, accessed by hashing the um, row ID? But you, st you still need locks. If you want to update them, then no, you still I'm need to lock. I'm saying that the, the actual uh, locking, the tree locking structure has multiple roots, and each root uh, deals with a different. Um, hashed value of the row ID. Uh, so are you referring to, in, to an index structure? Oh, well, yeah. Well, the, so there are two, in, two index structures, and we will discuss them. So one is a B3, B plus 3, and the other is a hash table. Uh, in a hash table, yeah, there is some contention there, too, that, that we need to, to worry about. I don't know exactly what kind of uh, protocol uh, database systems are using. But for B trees, that's a protocol that, that's being used. It's uh, called the tree, the tree protocol. Okay, so uh, we are, we are not, I'm not doing very well on time. So let me discuss this phantom problem before we take a break. Uh, uh, and please um, uh, pay attention. It's a, it's a subtle problem. Uh, so let me show you directly the, the issue. So I'm showing you here two transactions uh, and a big problem. So let's examine the transactions. And as you can see, I didn't write them as read and, uh, read and write operations. I wrote them as, as SQL queries. Uh, and look at what transaction one does. It just wants to select all the blue products. Maybe it wants to count them or display them or something. And then it does some other stuff. And then uh, it reads all the blue, blue products again. Uh, why a second time? I mean, who knows? It's a, this is a beginner program. It's non, none of you. They just read, um, they, they just wanted to read the blue products twice. Now, the other transaction wants to insert, insert a product uh, which is blue. And now my question to you is, uh, if, the, if the scheduler schedules them as, as here, the, 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 the select, the first select, then the insert, and then the second select. Is the schedule a serializable schedule or not? No. It's not serializable, no? What happens to the two selects on the left? Yes? The second one gets the extra product. The second one will see an extra product. So this is not a serializable schedule, but, but actually, if you look deeper, it gets worse. Because if I translate this into a sequence of read and write operations, then it is not just serializable, it's actually complex serializable. So let's, let's take a look. Let's suppose there are two blue products, call them x1 and x2. So what does the first select do? Well, it's going to read x1 and read x2. 
Uh, what does uh, the insert do? It's going to write, uh, neither x1 nor x2, it's going to write something uh, called x3. What does a first transaction do now? It's going to read them, it's going to read 1, 2, and 3. Where is the conflict? I mean, this is uh, conflict, it's, 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 it's a conflict serializable schedule, which is equivalent to what serial schedule? Who goes first? Which transaction should be executed first? T2. T2. Because we do have this, this uh, conflict here between uh, write to x3 and read x3. But something goes wrong. What goes wrong here? Obviously, when we look at the SQL queries, this schedule doesn't seem, it's not serializable. But if you write it down as a sequence of read and write, as we, as we learned, uh, it, it turns out to be serializable. What did we do wrong? Well, there are more reads in T1 than you've written down. I mean, it's effectively reading the entire table as an, an element that you haven't labeled. We're assuming that there's only two things uh, that are blue when you start. Right, but still, it's not fair to just say it's reading X1 and X2. It's reading something else, which T2 changes. Exactly. That, that's, that, that's what happens. This, this is X, X3 appeared of, out, of, out of the blue. Okay, no, no pun intended. It appeared out of nothing. It, it wasn't there before. So the assumption that we made so far, and it's called a phantom. The assumption that we made so far and that uh, doesn't hold is that the database is static. Uh, when we make the, the, uh, the assumption that we made so far was that the database consists of elements, and this set of elements is fixed. These are all the elements there are. But in practice, when an element is inserted or even deleted, then the database is dynamic. This set of, of elements is no longer fixed. It can uh, increase or it can decrease. And in our example, we had uh, this new blue element. So, um, um, yeah, the blue element was an element that uh, the tra second transaction inserted and it just appeared out of, uh, out of nothing. This is called a phantom. Uh, and dealing with phantoms is difficult. Uh, there are no simple solutions. Here are some solutions that database systems do. Uh, they can lock the entire table. Whenever you have to read or to write, you lock the entire table. This will guarantee uh, that a, a schedule, the, the schedules are serializable uh, and uh, they, they deal with phantoms correctly. A more clever way is to uh, index the, the attribute on which we read. Can you index all the blue, can, sorry, can you? A more clever way is to lock um, on, on the index entry for this attribute. If there is an index on, on blue, for example, then we would index, we would lock that particular entry. And this essentially prevents any, uh, anyone from uh, um, doing anything, anything to, to blue. Uh, they, they won't be able to um, insert a new blue element because that, needs, uh, that requires access to the, to the index. Or there is something called predicate locks, uh, which means these are not locks to an element, but they are locks to some predicate. And whenever somebody wants to uh, do some action, the system needs to check that that, that action doesn't satisfy the, the, any predicate of uh, the, for which there is a there is a lock, and that can also prevent phantoms. But bottom line, there is no clean way. There is no simple way that can um, ensure um, um, that that can ensure ensure serializability uh, and deal correctly with phantoms. Database systems do this. Probably they use they use the first option. Uh, or a combination of the other two, uh, and it's expensive. Good. So this is, a, 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 I have a question here. Yes. That's, it's more of a trivia. If, um, for what it's worth, MySQL does the second item by default if you're using uh -huh. this. So MySQL does this. So it, it places an index on, uh, uh, places an, a lock on the index entry. 
uh, if there is an index. It'll create indexes that won't sort of a, as a clustered index. Okay, any more questions or comments? Then we'll take a, let's say, four minutes break, and then we will discuss levels of isolation. Okay, so uh, as I promised, I brought here two copies of uh, the other book. Uh, I can lend them to people in this room, and please uh, share them uh, um, um, uh, among you. Uh, who would like a copy? I'm going to place them here. Good, so uh, let's continue. Uh, I would like to cover in this, uh, the remaining of the lecture two more topics. One is degrees of isolation, and the other is the ARIAS recovery manager. So let's start with degrees of, of isolation. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the default uh, level of isolation in uh, SQL is uh, the serializable level of isolation, or at least that should be the default. Uh, but as you saw, especially because of phantoms and, and because of the duration of the locks, um, this can be sometimes too expensive. Uh, and it's quite often the case that we can, uh, uh, we can relax, we can weaken uh, the, uh, this, uh, this requirement that the transactions be acid. Uh, uh, and this depends from application to application, but if we, we may be able to weaken this requirement uh, and as a consequence, improve performance. And this is what uh, often database administrators have to do in order to, to improve performance, to weaken uh, the, the degree of isolation. So um, what are these degrees? There are, there are actually four degrees defined by, uh, by the SQL standard. Uh, they are called read uncommitted. Read uncommitted means uh, that when a transaction reads a, a value, that value may be actually dirty. Uh, so the, the other transaction might abort. Uh, um, who knows? Might, might uh, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a dirty read. The other is read committed. Uh, now you're only reading committed uh, com values written by committed transactions. However, if you read it a, a second time, you might get a different value because maybe another transaction overwrote it. Uh, the third one is repeatable reads, and which are guaranteed that you're getting the same value if you read it multiple times. And the last one are serializable transactions. And there is a trade-off. Uh, the, uh, the level of consistency that we get is, is uh, uh, being traded off uh, by, uh, for performance. We get more performance for the weaker levels of, of isolations. <coughs> Okay, so uh, I essentially have this, uh, uh, the same information a second time. The syntax is here. We say set transaction isolation level, and then we say what isolation level we want. And that's uh, the isolation level that SQL will uh, implement. And ACID is only the last one. This is what uh, ensures ACID properties. Now I have a warning for you. Uh, this is a very fuzzy, uh, area of database systems, uh, every vendor feels free to, uh, you know, to break the rules a little bit in order to get better performance. Uh, so uh, you, you should not assume that by default the database system implements a serializable, um, implements serializable transactions. But do read the do documentation to understand exactly what, um, um, what they're doing. Question. Yes. Is there any isolation level which will avoid phantom records? Yes, that's a serializable um, isolation level. That should avoid uh, fan, uh, that should avoid the phantom problem. Okay, so let's discuss them one by one. The first one, uh, dirty reads, is called um, read. Uh, is, is called how is this called? Uh, read uncommitted. So it's isolation level read uncommitted. Here is how it's implemented. The implementation is actually easier to describe than any semantics. The implementation is like this. Transactions have locks for writes, and here uh, the, the scheduler implements strict two-phase locking. 
but there are absolutely no, no um, locks for reads. You want to read something, there is no lock. The consequence is that if you have an application where the transactions are read only, that application will run blazingly fast because no transaction needs, ever needs to, to acquire a lock. If you have an application where most of the transactions are, are read only uh, and uh, one or two uh, do some writes, then most of the read only transactions, they will run very, very fast. However, you, you should be aware that you, the, the reads might be uh, dirty, that you might read data that is, is not, not consistent. Second uh, uh, isolation level, uh, read committed. So the implementation here is, again, very straightforward. Uh, the locks for writes are long duration, which means strict to, to face locking. Uh, now the reads, they do have locks, but they are short, short duration locks. So that means that whenever, uh, whenever a transaction wants to read an element, a read lock is acquired first. Uh, but once the element is read, the read lock is released. This means that, that um, you will never read uh, a value that is written by a transaction that has not committed yet because that transaction still holds the right lock. So you will wait until the transaction who wrote that element commits. However, uh, since you're releasing the read lock immediately after you read, another transaction might overwrite it. And next time when you read it, you get a different value. So this is a read committed uh, isolation level. The next one, uh, it's called repeatable reads. And here the rule is very simple. Strict two-phase locking for both reads and writes. And this is not yet serializ serializable. Why is this not, why does not this isolation level not uh, ensure serializability? Because phantom problems. Because of the phantom problems, exactly. So this uh, ensures serializability over a static database. And it's a good serialization level because, um, uh, you know, if you want to ensure uh, complete serializability, then it's, it might get quite expensive. Yes? For the two database systems that we're using in class, what are the default serialization, uh, isolation levels? Um, Postgres and for, for, for Postgres, as far as I know, it's serializable. Read, read committed. Yeah. That's the default. If you don't set, if you don't specify anything, that's read committed. Does any anyone? Uh, SQL Server, right? Does anyone know what the default isolation level is for SQL Server? For SQL Server, I'm sure it's read committed. Or read committed? Yeah. For Postgres. Okay. Uh, the other question to ask is whether database systems indeed offer uh, the um, serializable um, isolation level. Uh, again, something to, to read in the documentation. And the last, uh, last uh, um, comment on, on, this, uh, on this part. Uh, sometimes if you declare transactions uh, uh, that are read only, then you can, you can get more performance from the system. You give the, you give the transaction uh, manager more options to schedule that transaction. Uh, and actually what they do is that they use optimistic concurrency control mechanisms for transactions that are read only, and they use locking for uh, transactions that are um, read and write. And this is, this, is the, this is the syntax. You say set transaction read only. Okay, any more questions about uh, uh, isolation levels? One more. Yes. Consider a scenario where we are not having a transaction and we are running you know, individual queries. Mm -hmm. So if we provide locking hints in the query, in the you know, SQL query, does it bypass the transaction isolation level that has been mentioned? Oh, I just I don't know. I don't, I don't even know the syntax of, of uh, locking hints. Okay. It means like 
with row lock and with no lock kind of a thing. Oh, if, you, if, if, if it says with no lock, then I'd be pretty, pretty convinced that this will not be serializable. Uh, yeah, no, what I'm asking is will it bypass the isolation level set? I, I suppose so. I suppose this is why, why they accept those hints. But uh, again, I, I, I would have to read the documentation of these hints. I, I don't know what they mean. Uh, but that's, that's the only thing they can do. They can bypass, they can, they can weaken the isolation level. Okay, so uh, what I want to do in the remaining of this lecture is to discuss one of the two advanced topics that I had in mind, which is the Aries Recovery Manager. Uh, next time, we will discuss uh, time-based concurrency control mechanisms, which are the optimistic concurrency control mechanisms. Uh, and they are, they are based both on the other book by Orman and Garcia Morina and uh, Widom, uh, and also some, some material on snapshot isolation that I didn't find in any book. Uh, and you need those for, for the homework. So you need uh, uh, both topics for uh, the homework, which is due two weeks from now. OK, so talking about Aries, let me start by revisiting some basic principles of the recovery manager. We discussed last time a very simple uh, recovery manager based on un undo or on redo or a combination of undo and redo. Uh, and that was a great way to get exposed to the basic uh, principles of a recovery manager, which I want to uh, recap now before we discuss areas and details. So uh, there are two ways in which you can implement uh, transactions, actually four ways. One is to allow uh, steal or non-steal. So um, the, the steal policy is when you allow um, when, when, you, when you allow a transaction that has not committed yet to override uh, an, an element that was written by a transaction that committed. And under no steal, you don't allow this. You do not allow uh, the override to happen until the transaction commits. So you, and, uh, with no steal, you're, you're, you're uh, postponing the outputs until the transaction commits. Steel does the opposite. It allows the transaction to override even if that transaction is not committed yet. The other uh, dimension is force non-force. It's easier to understand. Uh, force means whenever a transaction uh, modifies an element, you force that output to disk. <coughs> and non-force it means you, you allow that output to stay in the buffer pool you, you allow that update to stay in the buffer pool until uh, the buffer manager decides to output it. Now, the easiest combination for recovery is no steal with force, which means you are not, um, uh, you, you, you don't allow a transaction to overwrite until it commits. And when it commits, then you output all, the, it's, then you, you output all its updates to disk. And that's kind of the easiest way to recover. Actually, then there is nothing to recover because uh, the commit means that everything has been written to disk. Uh, but you guess the highest performance if you allow the other combination, steal, no steal. It's just a matter of terminology. There is, there is no new concept uh, on this slide. Now, um, the, the, what, what the write-ahead log does it, it allows us to, uh, to implement a steel no force uh, policy uh, through this concept of a log, through the concept of a uh, right ahead log. log. And um, the, the idea is that we will use a force po policy only for the log. And this is much more efficient than uh, forcing uh, all the transactions uh, to write to disk when they, com when they commit. Okay, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why we, why we do this discussion. It's a kind of a very high-level discussion, and my plan is to go deeper into details anyway. So why don't I move ahead and um, show you the, the, the details. This is an important concept here. When we discussed elements last time, uh, we said that they can be, an element can either be a page, or it can be a record, 
uh, or we left it open. It can be an entire table we said. Now we're going to look deeper into this. Uh, if, the, if the element is a page, then this is called physical logging. We log the physical page. If the element is a record, then we call this a logical logging. Think about a record as being smaller than a page. You usually fit multiple records in a page. Uh, and, and a log might combine both of them. And then it's called a physiological uh, logging. And this is what ARIES does. It has both physical and logical logging. And I will, I will, uh, we will discuss why. And finally, before we discuss ARIES in, in detail, let me, let me remind you the, the rules of a write-ahead log. These are essentially the rules, uh, um, the relaxed rules that are for undo, re redo logs. And there are two or three, depend depending on how you read them. First rule is that uh, before you output a page to disk, the, the, uh, log rec the log entry referring to that output must have been already sent to disk. Remember we had these arrows in our, uh, in our table? This, this says that the log entry must precede the output. It's a simple idea, but it's really critical that we, uh, uh, we keep this in mind. But otherwise, you can postpone. You, you don't have to force the, the log. You can postpone it, but not longer than the output. The second rule says that before a transaction commits, you must force its, its logs to disk, its log entries to disk. So this, I, let me represent it like this. Every log entry that belongs to a transaction must be forced to disk before that transaction commits. Okay? And the last rule is actually not a rule, but it's like a, like a definition. When, when does a transaction actually commit? When do we say that it has committed? When can we dispense the money? And the, the exact time moment when the transaction commits is when the commit log entry is written to disk. That's when the transaction commits. That's by definition. Good. So with this in mind, let's uh, discuss the ARIES Recovery Manager in mind uh, in details. Uh, let me start by saying that it is a redo undo log. So you will see both uh, both kind of actions, both redo and undo. But what is really surprising is that it uses physical logging for redo and logical logging for undo. So after the system crashes, when it, it, uh, when it, uh, in, during the redo phase, as we will see, uh, it will redo entire pages. But during the undo phase, it will undo individual records. Any ideas why? It's not a simple. It's not a simple answer. Does anyone have an idea why? Why do we do? Um, which one is easier? You think? Which one would be easier to reason about and easier to implement? Physical. The physical, right? And the physical, we don't have to worry about uh, who owns those, those records. It's, um, it's just that the page, we don't have to worry about whether the records are coming from indexes or they are database records or whatever are they. Uh, whatever is written on the page, this is what we redo. Why do we do logical level undo? Yes? Is the presumption that there's going to be more redoing than undoing? Actually, yes, there are many more redo, undoes than redos. There are many more. Uh, you, you, said, you said the, uh, the opposite. Said the opposite. Yeah, but there are actually many more undos than redos. And why is that? If the database never crashes, there are no, no redos, but there might be plenty of undos. And this might give you a hint. You can abort a transaction, you undo things. Exactly. Whenever a transaction aborts, we need to undo it. And this is when we use a log. And now it should be obvious, we cannot do a physical undo for a single transaction. 
because its records are packed together with, with records lost by, by other transactions on the same page. In order to undo a single transaction, in order to undo selectively a transaction, we must undo at a logical uh, level. Okay, first great uh, uh, insight. And by the way, do read chapter 18, actually not just 18, do read all three chapters in the book. They are, they are great for advanced, uh, um, for ad advanced study. They are not great at giving you the first detailed look at, at uh, concurrency control and at uh, recovery. For that, the other book is better. But once you understand the basic concepts, this is, this is a great, these are great, great chapters. Good, let's continue, Arias. The next uh, um, concept that is actually specific to all uh, uh, log recovery uh, managers is this notion of a log sequence number. It's very simple. Every entry in the log is a number. It's like a, like a key. Uh, and it, it, it's increasing. And if you want to refer back to a log entry, you refer to it by the LSN, by the log sequence number. Very simple. But here comes the red part. This is much more interesting. Every page, be it in, in the buffer pool or even written to disk, even the pages that are written to disk, every page has uh, an LSN which represents the, the latest log entry that refers to that page. Okay? So imagine this log that, that records many updates to the same page, but the last update this is what we actually store in the page itself. Just something to keep in mind. At the end, everything will fit together, but we need to um, look at all these data structures. And here are the three uh, big data structures and areas. I'm going to discuss them first, and I'm going to show you uh, um, a picture with them. And uh, the transaction manager maintains in my memory a table of all the active transactions. Let me re use... Uh, Blue. It's quite easy to understand. Uh, there is an entry for every transaction that is active. Uh, when a new transaction is started, we need to create a new entry. We need to uh, remember the name of the transaction or the identifier. And in addition, for every transaction, we have this important information, which is the last log entry of that transaction. Of course, when transactions update, they will generate log entries. And what we maintain in, in this table is for each transaction, the latest log entry. Good. The second data structure is the so-called dirty page table. Of course, there is a, the buffer, which uh, yeah, I didn't have it on this slide, but there is a, the main buffer, which is where we keep uh, pages in main memory. But in addition to that buffer, we maintain a separate table uh, where we list all the pages in the buffer that have been modified, and they, they, they are waiting to be sent to disk. And what we maintain here is for every dirty page, we maintain the earliest, the earliest log entry that caused that page to become dirty. If later updates make, uh, continue to update the page, we don't care about those log entries. We only maintain the earliest ones. And finally, uh, there is a write-ahead log, which is not main memory. Uh, but here, uh, the only interesting thing is that this has a pointer. Uh, all, all, the, all, the logs in the, uh, in the, all the entries in the log are linked um, based by, by transaction. So all the logs belonging to the same trans all the entries belonging to the same transactions are, are linked through pointers uh, backwards. Okay, let's review uh, everything we said um, with some examples. With some examples. So here is a buffer pool. Right here. So as you can see, there are there are some pages: page P5, P6, P7, and um, every page. Has, um, has an LSN that is the, the, 
the, the most recent log entry that refers to that page. Let's see what happens here. Uh, page 5, for example, uh, has a page LSN 104, which is this one right here. Now look at the dirty pages table. Uh, page 5 was modified, and therefore it appears in the dirty pages table. But what is the, the recovery LSN or the rec LSN? Yes, what? It's the first one that, first uh, LSN that modified that page? First LSN that modified that page. And it, it, it's always less than or equal to the page LSN. Every time we update the page, the page LSN increases, but the uh, rec LSN uh, remains the oldest one. Okay, and then there is um, this active transaction table uh, that maintains for every transaction, it maintains the last uh, log entry of that transaction. So all these things are like a spaghetti structure. They point to each other, and we need to keep this in mind to understand what's going on and how to recover. OK, so um, let's see first what do we need to do in order to understand these data structures. Let's see what we need to do, do during normal operation. Uh, there is a transaction, uh, T, and it wants to write a page called P. What do we need to do? Let me go back. Uh, so transaction T writes P. What do we need to uh, update? It's a buffer pool. Let's start with the buffer pool. What do we need to do here? Sorry? The, the page LSN. Actually, uh, now I realize this is not the best place to start. What do we need to do first? In the log entry. In the log entry, we need to refer to this page. And now we know what we put in page LSN. We put this, this the, uh, the LSN of this entry. What else do we need to do? Add it to the active transaction. Sorry? Active transaction. Exactly. To the active transaction, uh, we need to say that this transaction has modified. Um, it, now it's, it's LSN is 105. <coughs> what else do we need to do? If this is the first uh, time this, this page becomes dirty, then we need to add here um, an entry referring to the fact that this page was made dirty by, uh, by LSN 105. If it, if it was already dirty, then we don't add this. Okay. Um, second thing, suppose the buffer manager Yes, question. Are things removed from the dirty pages table once the transaction commits or something? Uh, ah, good question. When, are, when, are, when is it an entry removed from the dirty pages table? The page is forced to disk. When? When the page is forced to disk. When the page is forced to disk. Well, who would force a page to disk? Commit. A commit? No, we don't want... We, 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 we don't want commit to force pages to disk. So commit should only force logs to disk. Who should who should force the page to disk? The, the buffer manager. Remember the the first in uh, the, sorry the uh, LRU policy. The buffer manager has a completely different logic. It sometimes wants to to take this page and force this one to disk because of LRU. And then, it, then it's going to uh, write it to disk. And then it removes this from the dirty pages table. And this is actually my second question. The buffer manager wants to evict page P. What do we do? Let me go back. I'm going to erase this thing. And let's, let's think about evicting P. Uh, let me take P6. What do we do if we were to evict uh, P6? No, let me, let me take P4. P4 is here. Uh, not P4, P5, sorry. 
P5 is here. And now uh, we want to write it to disk, so it's not going to be dirty. So what do we need to do in this case? Yes? Write it to disk and remove the record from dirty pages? Uh, remove the record, but there is some, something much more subtle. We need to do something else. Where is this log sitting? This is the tail of the log. It sits in my memory. Uh, we kind of force it to disk, but not, ex not extremely aggressively. So what do we need to do now? Did you, did you want to comment something? Force all the entries that refer to the page. Yes, we need to force the log. Remember the rules? The first rule I showed you is that whenever we output a page to disk, the log entry for that page must have been sent to disk. Now imagine this log, it has many, many, uh, the tail of the log is, can be pretty long. Uh, all these are log entries that have not been yet forced to disk. You can't selectively force, long, you have to, to send an entire, an entire interval of, of entries to disk. But fr from, from the beginning up to what point? Yes? The last modification of the page. To the last modification of the page, that is so handy, exactly here. We need to send it so, so far back. So uh, we go through the log, and everything up to 104 needs to be flushed to disk before we output it. And then we can output it to disk. If the, if the tail of the log was longer, uh, we can keep this in main memory. <coughs> but up to 104, up to the, the page LSN, we need to flush to disk. And I think that's all we need to do. And finally, uh, when a transaction wants to commit, what, what we have to do in this case? If a transaction wants to commit, what was the rule that referred to committing a transaction? Yes? The log had to make it to disk. The, uh, all the entries that, re that refer to updates of that transaction must go to disk. So again, we need to read uh, the, tail, the tail of the log and force to disk up to what point? Yes? The, the row in active transactions. Up to last LSN. Up to the last LSN of the transaction that wants to commit. So these data structures, they, they talk very nicely to each other during normal operation. Now let's see what happens. Um, so let me see if I, if I got them right. So when a, when a transaction wants to write, we need to update these things. We need to flush the log. Yeah, I, I, did, some, I did say something wrong. Uh, the last one, uh, when a transaction wants to commit, you can't leave anything behind in my memory from the log because the last entry is going to be exactly the commit entry for your transaction. And that needs to go to disk as well. So in this case, you really have to flush the entire log to disk. And that's okay. That's what the log is supposed to do. It's to be, supposed to be forced. Good. So now let's look at, at recovery. And before we talk to recovery, about recovery, I'm going to discuss checkpointing. Uh, last week, we discussed a simple recovery manager based uh, on one on undo and the other on redo. And we discussed uh, checkpointing for the redo there. That was pretty complicated. The, the checkpointing for the ARIA system is actually much simpler. It's incredibly simple. What checkpointing does, it, it writes in the log the entire transaction table and the dirty pages table. It just writes them to disk. That's all it does. Um, but in addition, there is a background process, uh, or background, or maybe the, 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 the uh, page replacement uh, manager, that occasionally flushes to disk some, some of the pages. Uh, and that also uh, impacts uh, the recovery. But, um, okay, so now we can finally discuss recovery. So now the system crashes, we analyze the log, we find the latest, uh, the latest checkpoint, that checkpoint gives us the two tables, the dirty pages table and the transactions table. And from here on, we need to do 
uh, first an analysis, and then to do the redo, and then to do the undo. So the analysis uh, is essentially at a the, the high level, uh, we'll just figure out, figure out what happened since the last checkpoint until the time of the crash. And we, we look at them very closely. Uh, the redo is a standard redo. The only question is how far back do we need to go? And the undo is actually more complicated. The undo, because it's a logical undo, will be, will turns out to be more complicated. Okay, so let's do the analysis. I'm going to skip this picture. Um, let me start right here. So the log goes from left to right. This is time. And here is where the crash happened. So we read the log and we look at the, the most recent checkpoint. What we find there are these two tables, the dirty pages and the active transactions. This tells us immediately how far back in the log we need to go when we do the, the redo recovery. How far back? How far back do we need to go uh, when we do the recovery, the, the redo? Yes? The smallest LSN in dirty pages? The smallest LSN in dirty pages, exactly. The smallest LSN. So, because this refers to the earliest point when any page was updated and it, still, it was still dirty in the buffer pool when the system crashed. This is how far back we need to go. Okay, and now comes something very, very fun. This was, these were the pages at the time of the checkpointing. We need the, pay, the same, the same, sorry, these were the dirty pages and the active transaction at the time of the checkpointing. We need them here at the time of the crash. How can we, how can we compute these two tables at the time of the crash? It's actually a trivial question. It's almost not a question. We, we just read the log, and every single, every single record tells us what to do to these pages. It's called replaying the history. So we read the log, uh, and we simply replay the history. We, uh, what can we find in the log? Well, maybe we find an update. It says transaction T has modified page B, and the old value was V. No, sorry, this is the new value. The new value is V. Then what do we do? Well, um, if P was in the dirty pages table, then uh, we don't do anything. If P was not there, then we create a new entry in the dirty pages table, and we insert uh, this LSN as its, as its recovery LSN. What else could we find in the logs that affect these two tables? A commit, maybe transaction uh, T commits. Then what do we do? We remove it from the active transactions table. What else can we find in the log that might be of interest? Abort, Abort which is like commit, but something else. The opposite. Start. Starty. Then what do we do? Then we create an entry in the active transactions. So we replace the history, and that's what I find amazing. We are able to reconstruct what was in my memory at the time of the crash, namely these two tables, the dirty pages and the active transactions. Okay, so now we are almost ready for the, for the redo phase, but let me ask you this. When we computed the first LSN, we used uh, the, the dirty pages at the time of the checkpointing. Is that the right thing to do? Should we use the dirty pages at the time of the, um, of the crash, maybe? Which information should we use when we compute the first LSN?
Can we have, in, in, uh, after the replay, can we have uh, a, a recovery lesson that goes even further behind? No, we cannot have this. Because all these, all these updates of this kind, they come later. Uh, and they, uh, they, they will only insert in the 30 pages entries whose recovery LSN is going to be later. Uh, and, and conversely, there is no, nothing, no, we, we don't have any information about the pages that have been forced to disk, that have been outputted to disk. That information is missing from during our uh, replay history. We don't get that information. So uh, we are forced to use this as our starting point for the recovery. OK, so this is um, the second phase, the redo phase. We start from that first LSN, and we just start uh, our redo phase, the, the, exactly the way you know it. But Iris is actually smarter. It tries to be very efficient, and it, uh, it avoids aggressively doing the redos that are not needed, that are not necessary. Uh, and um, here are the rules that it uses in order to avoid doing some redos that are not needed. The first rule is that uh, it looks at the page. Uh, it, it, it sees an, an, an update record in the, in the log. And if that page is not uh, listed as, dir as dirty, then it means, well, it, was, it, it, it has been flushed already to this. So there is no need to uh, update. OK, but su suppose the page is 30. Then there is a second rule. Maybe uh, it, it was made dirty, but it was made dirty by a log entry that comes later. The, the value that we are currently, uh, that we would redo with, based on the current entry is actually an old value. Because later the page was made dirty, and this is, this is why it, it ended up in the dirty pages table. Don't redo. And the third thing is really aggressive. So now it thinks that uh, this, this might be a, an un, a redo to, that is, it is actually it's, that's active, that needs to be done. But b before it does a write operation, which is more expensive than a read, it reads the page from disk. And it checks the page LSN on disk. Maybe, maybe it was still forced to disk. Maybe that's a newer information. And then it, it doesn't do the write. And, and it, it essentially trades off a read for a write. And if anything fails, then yeah, then it performs uh, the redo, the update. What exactly is the recovery LSN? What is the recovery LSN? This comes from the dirty pages table. I don't know if you notice my color code. So I'm using exactly the same colors for these data structures. So the dirty pages table are in red. The recovery LSN uh, is uh, the earliest LSN of any log entry that made that uh, page dirty. But what happens is that if the page was flushed to disk, then it is made, it is made under, it's made, it's made clean, it disappears from the dirty pages table. And when it is written again, then it gets reinserted in the dirty pages table with a much newer recovery LSN. And what, what happens in number two here is that the updates that came before this most recent uh, dirty write, more, more, before more, this most recent write, they are skipped. And does this answer your question? Maybe your question was much shorter. That's my question, yes. Uh, it was just named rec and ascent previously, so I kind of missed that. Got it. You, you, your question was much shorter, indeed. Uh, recovery LSN and rec LSN means the same thing. Thanks. Good. So that's the, re the redo phase. Um, 
it's actually not it's, it's very easy but it's it's very smart uh, it uses all this it uses all the smartness in order to um, uh, improve efficiency okay so now the undo once it finishes with the redo uh, RES will start the undo phase uh, which is also needs to do uh, outside of the recovery process whenever a transaction um, um, aborts it needs to be able to uh, to undo the entries for that transaction okay so this is more more difficult let's see how to best um, describe this the idea here is that uh, this is not replaying history or re uh, or undoing history this is really about doing some updates which are real updates and therefore they need to be written in the log so during the undo phase uh, it starts from the end it uh, it it, un it undoes the, the transaction that needs to be undone but as during this process it writes in the log uh, some special entries that are called CLRs called compensating log records with the idea that if the system crashes during the undo these are the records that need to be redone in order to do the undo okay so let's see um, in some more details how, how this works um, so for the first thing to to figure out are which are the transactions that have not committed and uh, we discussed them last time it's exactly the same concept we need to figure out which are the transactions that have not committed uh, in this case and the, and the uh, for areas these transactions are very easy to collect uh, they are exactly those in the active transaction table and moreover they have this funny name they're called loser transactions okay the loser transactions are those that are uncommitted okay so now uh, conceptually what we need to do we need to go back in the log this is our log and we need to, to skip only to those entries that belong to the loser transactions if this were a single transaction then uh, it's very easy to imagine what what goes on we need to read the latest log entry of that transaction undo it skip to the previous log entry undo it skip to the previous one undo it and so on by the way as we do this we will append at the end of the log what CLRs such that if we crash we will not un un we will not undo these things but we will redo the the, um, the the CLRs okay but the problem is that we don't have a single transaction to to chase but we have a set of transactions or the loser transactions so this is why the logic is slightly more complicated but it's conceptually not, not nothing new here uh, to undo is a set of all transactions that we need to undo and what we do at each point um, uh, it's actually sorry it's not a set of transactions the set of their last LSNs so what we do at each point we choose the um, the largest such LSN which is this one here this is like, like the, the latest log entry of any uncommitted transaction undo it and uh, then uh, add to the uh, to do set its previous LSN and again choose the, the latest one the largest one so we, we, we chase down this list uh, but in a, in a slightly more complicated way in which we have a set of transactions that we are watching and we always choose the biggest LSN of all these transactions so now let's look at a little bit in more detail at what uh, what we do during the undo so if this LSN if, if the LSN we are looking at let me use a different color if the LSN we are looking at is um, is a regular record uh, a regular update record then we undo it as we expect 
and we write a CLR. And we link this CLR to, to this, to the previous entry of this, uh, of this log entry. Such that if we ever have to, if the system crashes during the undo phase, then and as we will redo the CLRs, uh, we, we, we will redo and then we know how to, con to continue the undo from, from this last blue arrow. Okay, on the other hand, if the LSN is a CLR record, uh, then we don't undo it, but instead we insert its pointer into the, um, <clears throat> into the to undo list. Okay, and at some point we also need to, uh, to mark the end of the transaction. But now I, I, I wonder, Yeah, I wonder whether in the other case we should also insert an end transaction. Maybe this is something we can discuss on the on the next slide. So let me let me try to summarize this um, um, the, the undo phase. Maybe it's easier to uh, to see to to imagine a single transaction. So uh, the single transaction has these uh, entries in the log. And they are linked like this. So LSN 30 points back to LSN 20, which points back to LSN 10. And now we need to, uh, we need to undo. So we, we undo uh, the, the entry for uh, LSN 30, and we write a compensating uh, um, log record that points back to 20. It's clear where we get the 20 from. This is exactly this pointer here. Okay, then we move to the next entry. So we undo uh, the action uh, for the log entry 20. We write a CLR, and that now will, be, will point back to 10. And at this point, the system crashes. And we have not yet finished, um, we have not yet finished uh, undoing this transaction. So then what, we, what do we do? Uh, we read back from the log again. So let me use red now. We find this undo record. We don't do anything. But instead we, we, we follow, <coughs> we follow this pointer here. And now we know, we know that this is where we have to continue our undo. So we continue and we write this entry and now th this is null. There is nothing to point to because there is no other, uh, no other entry. And this is when we, uh, when we know that that transaction is terminated. This is when we write an end transaction here. Every time you do the sub undo, do you also insert effectively the CLR as the last transaction for that? Sorry, as the last entry for that transaction. That yeah, every time. Every time you do an undo operation, you have to insert the CLR. No, but do you make the CLR as being the active transaction, as the last transaction for the active transaction, effectively? Because otherwise, you would go read through them, and 20 and 30 are still going to be in the log. So why do you look for the CLR number 50 here, instead of trying to go to 30 again? So uh, after the system recovers, that's a question? Well, so yeah, when the system recovers, it still sees the 30 as the last transaction for, for as the last entry for this transaction, unless you're saying that the CLRs are effectively going to become the last transaction, last ah, entry for this transaction. Right, so, so the question is how do we avoid, how do we avoid reading this again? How do we avoid reading uh, LSN 30 again? And the reason, the, the reason we can avoid this is because we start the recovery from here. 
And since the first entry we see is a, is a CLR, that points us all the way back to, to, uh, to record 10. Does this make sense? Maybe we should, we should look again at, this, at these rules. Uh, so in that case, if we restart uh, the, the undo process, then the first record we see is a CLR, so we are here. But so, do you mean to say that the transaction table will list the CLR record as its last LSN for the no. transaction? The, uh, yes. So, uh, uh, so the question is whether we introduce the CLRs in the active transaction table. It's a good question. I think, uh, are you sure they are being introduced in the active transaction table? Once the CLR is written to the log, we know that it, it's, uh, its undo action has been, it's been done. It's been uh, written to disk. Uh, and, and therefore, they, they don't need to be, well, no, they are actually redone. Uh, that's actually a good question. So I, uh, But there, aren't they redone and undone because we've processed the, the CLRs while we were redoing? We, we process them, but we only process them in order to find the pointers to uh, where we left, where we, are, where, where we left in the, un, in the undo process. Oh, I thought that the redo was reprocessing the CLRs. Yeah, this is, this is what I said, and, but now, and now I, don't see, I don't see the place for, it's for them to be reprocessed. So let me let's think a little bit. Uh, actually, the undo of a CLR can be complex. It can, be, it can say, uh, remove this entry, this record that was inserted. When you remove an, a record, it means complicated updates to the B, to the B tree. Those updates, and when you undo them, yes, you're right. So whoever asked this question from Microsoft is, is correct. Uh, the undo action can consist of multiple uh, writes because it is a logical undo. So uh, the undo could mean you have inserted this record in the database. Now undo this, remove it. Take it back, which means remove it from the index, which could mean many, uh, many index uh, blocks are being restructured now. And these are, physical, these, these are written as um, actions that, that need to be redone if the system crashes. OK, let's, let's uh, go through this again um, here. Because it's, it's, it's really an important point and makes a, makes a, makes a distinction between physical logging and logical logging. Um, and I'm not going to start a new topic. Uh, we are going to end on this, uh, on this slide. So we are undoing uh, this transaction that starts here. But the first undo action uh, the, the first undo action consists of uh, several operations that need to be written to the database. Those operations I'm not exactly sure whether they need to be written to the log before or after the CLR. Uh, any suggestions? Let's try them before and see what happens. So uh, to undo this, we need to, to, to write the following things to, to the database. And we mark this as regular updates in the log. When we finish this, we say CLR, if you crash, Continue from here. Next operation. Now we need to undo uh, number 20. Again, we write to the, to the log all the entries that correspond to uh, this undo operation. Uh, we finish. We write the CLR and point back here. Now comes the interesting part. Now we... Yeah, now it's, it becomes quite obvious that I, I wrote them in the wrong place. So now we start undoing, undoing number 10. So we write these entries here, but now the system crashes. During recovery, all these uh, redos, all these things will be redone. Right? So the, the, uh, if, if we missed to send to disk, 
these updates to the uh, index that reflected removing the record. That's okay. They will be redone during recovery because they are right here in the log. Okay? Um, but, but here we're in trouble. We don't want these to be, to be uh, uh, recovered because this is where we will continue. We will continue to undo from here. So that means that those entries need to be written after the CLR. Okay, so let's, let's go again. We, we still have a few minutes, so I, I think it's, it's fine if we, if we go over this. So um, we need to undo CLR, uh, we need to undo um, LSN 30. Uh, we first write the undo record to make sure <coughs> no, but this doesn't work either because now the system can crash exactly. Uh, uh, okay, so how does it work then? So we write these entries to disk, uh, and then we do what? Yeah. Does it not just have two records, one at the beginning and one at the end? No, it has a single record, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and I'm also pretty sure that there is a redo uh, on the CLR. So the, the undo actions are subject to be, re to be redone if the system crashes. Um, so we, we wrote this to disk. Uh, we wrote this to, to the log. Uh, then we write the CLR. Same here. We write the CLR. And now when we want to undo number 10, Um, good question. Why don't we read a book and figure this out uh, for next time? Okay. With irises like this, so it's, you have a lot of fun reading the initial part, but when you get to CLRs, then it's like, oh no, uh, too much. Uh, the CLRs are really are, it's a, the part that makes RES less, uh, less attractive. But uh, by next time we'll figure out, and we'll figure out exactly how uh, recovery goes if the system crashes during the undo phase. Good. So I'd like to skip to, to finish here. I have one more slide on, uh, uh, on RES. Um, it was celebrated in the database community in the early 90s when it was first published by Mohan, who is a researcher at uh, IBM Almaden, uh, because it put together, uh, it didn't have new ideas, uh, but it put together many ideas that people in the research community had discussed about uh, recovery in one comprehensive package. So he really thought about all the details and how they fit together. And this is what's remarkable about ARIES, is that all these things, they fit together and the, the whole package is uh, efficient and uh, you can't remove one thing without breaking the whole. That's, uh, that's nice. Uh, and it's also used in all modern database systems. Um, not, as far as I know, all of them use ARIES and if they are commercial systems, they have some kind of licensing agreement with, uh, with IBM. Uh, yep, yeah. and that's all I have to say about Arias. I think that's a good place to stop. And next time we will figure out how CLRs work. I mean, you will tell me. <laughs> okay, any more questions, remarks? Good, then have a good, a good evening. Um, have fun with homework three, and I'll see you next week. And don't forget there are two books here if you want to grab one. I uh, just need them back in two weeks after we finish the homework. <laughs>